And all public attendees are invited to participate in the meeting at the designated opportunities. If you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, use the raise hand function on, on Zoom to indicate so. We'll, we will unmute your microphone for you to share. You can also use the chat feature at any time or submit a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and that's all I've got. Okay, thank you so much, Miles. Welcome everyone. This is the Neighbor Southwest NAC meeting uh, for February 15th, 2022. It's great to have you all here. And we have a full agenda tonight, so we will start right away. And I'm not sure if Officer Fleckenstein is in the room yet. So, no, okay. Um, so we can circle back when he gets here. And Gary Keck, could we turn the floor over to you? From uh, he's our representative from THPRD. Hi, Gary. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Uh, so what I'll do is go over. We've got a little report that I'll just go over with everybody. Uh, so first thing on our report is that if you know of anybody that THPRD is hiring, uh, we have lots of opportunities available. So you can visit our website to learn more on that. And a reminder that spring registration is coming. So save the date. It's going to be Saturday, Saturday, February 26th. And the activity guides are online for classes that run from March through June is this registration that's coming up. And then it's um, we've got a, a bunch of planting going on. Um, staff are planting trees and cleaning up several parks and trails currently. And we've got lots of volunteer opportunities. Uh, many of them are like one day volunteer signups. So go ahead and get on the website and take a look at the volunteer tab and you can see what might be in, in the neighborhood. Um, and we had a, a special thanks out to the Central Beaverton NAC who are teaming up with us to do a tree planting this month at Schiffler Park. And I think that's one of your agenda items later in the meeting to talk about. Um, so it's been a great partnership with, with them. Uh, that's the Saturday, actually, that we're doing that. And then we've got our native um, plant sale starting this month. So you can order online between, uh, I guess, today, February 15th through March 15th. And then you can pick up plants in April at the Talton Hills Nature Center. So if you're interested in that, it looks like they've got over 100 species that are climate resilient native plants that can help support nature in your yard. And then for those of you who have youngsters, the preschool registration opens this month and TH Purity offers a nine month preschool um, throughout the district, there's different locations. So take a look at that registration online. And we're got a we're on a lookout for middle school cross country and track coaches. So if anybody's interested in volunteering to be a, a coach, um, again you can see that online. But it's the middle schoolers that are looking to to get some coaches to help out with them. And we're going to update kind of in our neighborhood the Conestoga pool. We're getting close. We've been working real hard on that. Tim actually is our project manager on that. He's been doing a great job. But we're looking to open that in March. So that'll be exciting to get the pool back open. I toured it last Friday and the new decks poured, the pool's full of water. We're just doing the final touches now. So it's real nice to see it coming to a finish. And then um, we do have a new dog run that we're working on. It's up in the nor northern area and we're on 217 and, and um, Highway 26 there at um, Ridgewood Park. We're gonna start putting in a little dog run there this summer. We just wanna let everybody know we know dog runs are popular. So that is the rundown for the park district this month. So I'd be happy to take any questions. And if I can't answer them, I'll, I'll get back to everybody. All right, looks like we're good. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate all the THPRD updates. And I apologize to everyone in my excitement for tonight, I completely skipped over introductions. <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, my name is Allison Balbag and I'm the chair for the Neighbor Southwest NAC. It's really wonderful to be with you all tonight to discuss um, issues and concerns in our community. And I would also love to introduce Miles Glowacki. He is our staff liaison uh, for the SNAC. 
So thanks, Miles, for all of your work in logistics for us. All right, so our next item is, I don't see Officer Fleckenstein yet, so we will keep moving forward. And uh, we had a request from community members to discuss safety concerns on Barrows. And this is Colette and Kelly and Jennifer. And Colette, you, let's see, I'm not sure if your colleagues are here yet. Oh, yes, they are. And Kelly and Jennifer, I'm um, swapping or shifting you over to panelists. So you're welcome to activate your cameras and mics for us. Hi, Kelly, welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Thanks for reaching out. We, re we really appreciate it. Hi, Jennifer. I don't think I'm a panelist yet. Oh, sorry, Colette, let's see. Okay, Colette, I just updated that. Did it come through on your end? There I am. Okay, great. Hi, Colette. So, uh, Kelly, Jennifer, and Colette reached out um, to bring up some concerns, uh, safety concerns and driving concerns on Barrows. So I will turn the floor over to you, three. Who wants to start? <laughs> Probably usually me. Um, so I live in a property that backs to Barrows and Roshack, and my house is directly behind the roundabout. Um, I think I've already kind of gone over a lot of the things. So where we're at is that the city has done some planting in the roundabout and they just completed a speed study. And where we're at with them is trying to request some traffic calming measures to be put in place. Um, some things that we want specifically to protect the properties that are at risk for the accidents that happen um, I've had two crashes into my property since July of 2020. Um, one was in the middle of the night and I was able to get a police report and luckily get insurance information so that it was not coming out of my pocket to fix it. Um, it was a brick wall crash into my brick wall. And um, then just about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I had at 2 p.m. 2 PM in the afternoon, a drunk driver drive through my backyard and into my neighbor's. Um, damaging both of our fences and luckily not hitting my children um, or us. And so we've been working with the city. I've been working with them since October, 2020. We went on the traffic commission meeting this month and were suggested to reach out to you guys to ask for your help. And so that's kind of the place we're at. We don't know what the speed study results are gonna be. I've tried to ask Jabra if he's just gonna only use that as a tool to determine lowering the speed. Um, I have not gotten a response to him um, on that. Um, sometimes he's a little tough to get to respond. We've included the mayor and her chief of staff has been involved. And when her chief of staff got involved, that pushed him a little more to be more responsive recently. Um, and so we're just hoping that there's something more that you guys can do to elevate our voice and get some things put in place that are gonna make this a safer area for us. Um, one of the roadblocks right now that we're basically at is the speed limit is too high for some of the traffic calming stuff because it's 35. And so that is the goal of the speed study. Um, I do know that he did share with us that they've changed the metrics for the speed study. So I'm hoping that this speed study can let us change the speed. But the last speed study that was done in November of 2020 would not warrant a speed reduction. So it's concerning that it's possible that if that's the only tool used that we'll be in the same kind of stuck point of there's nothing that the city can do to help us. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, for that information. And just so that everyone uh, here tonight is on the same page, 
uh, I just want to confirm that this is the roundabout on Barrows that's um, that's close to Shoals. Yes. It's, it's nearby, so it's um, kind of close to the the commercial center that has um, biscuits and yep. um, biscuits, some other. Pasta Lola. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure everyone is uh, picturing that same area in mind. Thank you. Brothers. Yeah. No, I've been here since. May, April, May of 2014. And I've literally been on scene at almost every single accident that's occurred at the roundabout. From the motorcyclist that we all heard groaning as he died, to the Prius driver who was on drugs as well as intoxicated with alcohol, to, I mean, it, it's been horrible. Um, I witnessed, well, I didn't witness it, but I had kids um, doing distance learning as Kelly's fence before, literally like maybe three weeks before she moved in, got pummeled into by a car um, and took those photos. Um, as someone who has first responder training, but is still protected by Good Samaritan laws, this is absurd, guys. This is absolutely absurd. And, and the pushback we're getting from the city, from Jabra, from he's saying that we're like, okay, well, let's at least put in crosswalks, signals that are similar to further down the road that you guys just installed two years ago. He's like, oh, well, we don't typically do that because it's a two-way road. You just did it two years ago on the same road, that makes no sense. Like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> uh, do more deaths need to happen? Like, this is stupid. Um, and, and the fact that my, my neighbors, my next door neighbors, I mean, I was already scared and I've, I brought this up in 2018. I'm the one that, um, I guess, caused the LED lighting and the delineators and the other things to already occur back in 2018. Um, but I'm afraid for my, my own children, as well as Kelly's children, as well as Jennifer's children, that they're gonna, someone else is gonna die, guys. We have to do something. And, and, <laughs> Uh, I can give you countless statements just on crossing the roundabout on how unsafe it is. And there's two schools, an elementary school and a high school within a mile's distance. And they don't use the sidewalks. They walk in the bike path. And I'm just waiting. And that's really sad because I don't know what else to do because no one else is doing anything. So please help us. Thank you, Colette, um, for sharing all of this with us. And Kelly, did you have anything else to add um, at this time? I'm the, sort of the newest one here. I've been here since December of 2020. Um, and in the short time that we've been here, we've witnessed um, at least five accidents in the roundabout, whether they were involving the authorities or just a sign getting knocked over. Um, I feel like a big part of the problem is that people use barrows as a cut through to stay off of shoals, um, to not get caught when they're drunk driving or, you know, to have a little a raceway because it's a pretty straight shot off of the roundabout. Um, yeah, it's concerning. I'm scared to let my kid play in my backyard. I'm scared to walk down barrows for fear of getting hit by a car. And it is very frustrating that the city has kind of given us excuse after excuse as to why things aren't being done. Um, so we really hope that you all can sort of give us some ideas on where to go from here. Well, thank you, Kelly and Jennifer and Colette um, for reaching out to the NAC and um, we hear your frustrations <laughs> on, on this front. Um, I am 
glad that my neighbor Andrew Abbey is also here tonight and he has his hand raised and um, Andrew has some thorough experience with the traffic calming process with the city of Beaverton. So it looks like he has some insight to share with us too on this. Well, Hi, thank, you. thank you very much for your, um, for sharing your thoughts with us. That's pretty sobering information. I'm somebody that traveled Barrows quite a bit. I did not realize that there were those extent of problems on Barrows. So thank you for sharing. Um, I will candidly tell you that Alice and I um, uh, were working on uh, trying to get some traffic calming in another area of, of our NAC. And um, we had similar experiences with lack of follow-up. Um, and I won't belabor that or go into detail, except um, council recently changed a traffic calming program where it used to be two thirds support and now it's 50% support. But what I also learned from uh, two things from our experience, and I'll be extremely brief. One is, is that um, there are certain classifications of street, streets that are just automatically ruled out for any traffic calming. And I don't know the classification of barrows, but I suspect it is an arterial. And that may be where the rub is coming in. Is the more traditional traffic calming like speed bumps is not something that the city traffic engineer rightly or wrongly will support on um, arterials. Um, so I think step number one would be to um, ascertain the um, status of barrows um, I have a meeting with the Beaverton planning manager on March 1st, and um, she is not the city traffic engineer, but I will be more than happy to nail down what the various street classifications are, because that's really the first step, according to the first, you know, the first order of criteria to determine what can or cannot be done in terms of, again, the traditional traffic calming. The second point I wanted to make is, um, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, but I think the city of Beaverton typically relies on what's called 85th percentile speeds. So in other words, um, speed limits are not necessarily, um, and this is just my perception, I could be wrong, but my perception is, is City of Beaverton uses 85th percentile, which is basically, they measure the speed of the 85th percentile vehicle going down Barrows Road, and then that's what governs the speed limit. Um, there's other approaches to setting speed limits, like looking at the geometry of the road, the width of the road, uh, driveways, access points, et cetera, where you kind of come up with the bottoms up speed limit number. But I suspect that this is being uh, driven more by the 85th percentile. So bottom line is let's just assume for sake of argument, I'm just making this up. 30, 35 miles an hour is a safe speed, but if the 85th percentile is measured at, again, I'm making this up 45 miles an hour, then when you use the 85th percentile method of determining the speed limit, that's what they base it on, not necessarily what we think the speed limit should be. So I, I hope that's somewhat helpful. But again, I will be happy to, um, to at least ascertain what the street classifications are and then um, see what the next step might be. Um, there was quite a bit of um, discussion by one counselor about changing the traffic calming program. And at some point there may be some um, further changes coming out of that. I will just tell you there's other neighborhoods where people have been really frustrated that the way the current uh, process is set up, it's kind of designed to weed projects out rather than move them forward. So I think it might be good if we could just take your names and contact information and then I'll certainly keep my ear to the ground and I'd be happy to reach out as I get more information. Sorry, for the, sorry for the long remarks, but I just wanted to share what I knew. Mm -hmm. Can I add a couple things to that? Um, so I believe it is an arterial road. I'm pretty sure that Jobber said that when we had a meeting at the roundabout in December and the, the 85 percentile speed at the last speed study was 38 miles per hour at the 85th percentile. But Jabra shared with me that it has now been changed to the 50th percentile for speed determinations down from 85th percentile. So it's possible that that's gonna be in our favor since it was at 38 at the 80th, 85th percentile. And we did our due diligence driving very slowly <laughs> during the speed study for the week and made sure we drove down barrels as many times as we possibly could going 30 or below to try to make help in any way we can since they have a silly way. So I believe it is an arterial street. I would 
I appreciate confirming that, but I do think that is the type of road that it is. Um, and that's all I kind of wanted to add. We did have some of that piece. And I do wonder if Jobber keeps us out of the traffic calming program because it's a long process and it requires approval of a lot of neighbors. And I know that that's changed to 50th percent too, and like a 51% instead of what it used to be. Um, but we've wondered why he doesn't utilize that program. And I don't know if that's in our favor so that we don't get drugged through that. And he wants to take action. He did put up a speed reducing sign and he um, did add some more delineators. They did do some new landscaping in the roundabout like about a week ago. Um, so, but I appreciate, we appreciate all the help that we can get with you guys and making our voice bigger. Yeah, and the one other thing is that what I learned at the, out, at the very end of our process is there is a link on the traffic calming website. So I would go on there because you can send emails and they don't go anywhere. You have to go on that link through the traffic calming website. And, you know, Alice and I worked through this for like a year and a half. There was no response to the emails. If it doesn't go through that intake form on the traffic calming website, then there's no follow up. So that, that's the piece I learned is, is you, you don't just email staffers. You got to go through that portal where they kind of track everything. And then I'd be really specific on what you're asking for. But again, I'll, I'll verify all those uh, street classifications. And Allison, could we put this back on the agenda for next month? And then I'll do whatever research I can find and we can kind of continue this important conversation. Sure. And then it, yeah, and if we can get you, we can kind of give you to not draw this out and take any more time. I can send you, if you email us, we can respond in the specific requests that we've had and the exact things that have already been done. We're supposed to meet with Jabra and Chad Lynn and Jeff Hunsaker again after the speed study, but Jabra hasn't said when that's gonna happen. Well, if they've committed to a meeting, you're way, way ahead of the game because yeah, Alice and I tried to have a meeting and um, and I, I don't know if it'd be prudent, Allison, but if either or both of us could maybe attend the meeting and just listen in, we don't need to like comment necessarily, but I, I wouldn't mind being invited just to listen in and kind of track what's being said. We, we, we met them at the roundabout in December and the, re, the way that I, we were able to get that accomplished but was reaching out to the mayor and the mayor has seen enough of our emails that she asked her chief of staff, Shannon Walton Clark, I think her name is, to yeah. contact me and I spoke with her on the phone and she made Jabra talk, call me back and email me and set up a meeting and so that was the avenue that got us I've been dealing with him since October. I've talked to him a couple of times. We've emailed, there's some progress, but it's slow moving. And that was kind of a step that got us in front of him. And in the December meeting, that was the plan was to do the speed study and meet again and go over it and figure out what steps were next. As right. someone who is a um, OCC licensed business owner, I've also involved the OCC because the last three accidents that happened in the same week we're all drunk drivers, DUIs. So we're meeting with them as well. Mm -hmm. Well, keep I'm us sorry. posted. And then why don't we continue this discussion to our next meeting in two months and see where we're at. And in the meantime, feel free to reach out and let us know if there's any meetings in the interim. Because I, I personally would very much like to track this. I don't think two months from now is... I get you guys need your research, but... <laughs> Good Lord. So I see we have some hands raised. Uh, Miles, I see you're first in, in the queue on my end. Yeah, uh, Farrell's Road is a collector street. That's its designation, two lane collector. Um, so it is eligible for traffic calming measures. Once that, like they've said, once the, the speed percentile falls within the, the range of qualifying, so it's not out of the realm of possibilities that after the speed study, the traffic calming would be considered. Um, there's other roads in the city where people are having other, you know, other traffic issues and they, they find out that traffic calming is not allowed on that kind of street at all. So um, at least it's an option in this one. And Miles, um, uh, from, the, from your perspective uh, as a city staff member, are there any other, um, options or directions that Colette, Kelly, and Jennifer should be pursuing on this front? Um, let me think about that. Okay. 
yeah, give me a few minutes to think about that. Great, thank you. All right, Kevin Teeter, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, hey, everybody, I'm not actually in this neighborhood. I'm in the Central Beaverton neighborhood, but we've had a lot of uh, conversations about traffic calming ourselves also. Um, I think for the traffic calming updates, I think it's even easier than just um, getting 51% of the people to say, yes, we want this, but it's 51% of the people who actually respond. So if it, it's not like, oh, you have to have full neighborhood canvassing now. Now it's just like, okay, we're going to measure who sends in their cards and who sends in their feedback. So I think that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then Allison, you just made a question about like, are there any other good next steps that might be helpful? Um, Andrew, are you talking with Anna Slatinsky? Is that who you're meeting with? I'm just meeting with a Beaverton planning manager on another okay. project, and she's yeah. familiar with with what those street classifications are. She's not yeah. a traffic engineer, but I, I can certainly go to her and get all the... And I'm going to just editorialize here for a minute, and maybe I'm off track, but I'm going to say my opinion anyway. Um, I, I personally don't think it makes a lot of sense to have everything go through this rigmarole of, of collecting cards and and doing all the affirmative stuff. And I mean, I'm of the personal opinion that you should have traffic engineers that simply go out and get the speed data and make their engineering judgments. And if a street is unsafe, the city of Beaverton should deal with it. And we shouldn't have to run through these hoops to get, okay, formally two thirds, now 50% of the people to sign up in favor. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. And maybe I'm out of line for saying that, but I just think I think it risked the city of Beaverton to lawsuits and more importantly, risk these very unsafe situations that we're talking about. If there's a solution out there that will make barrows safer, then my personal opinion is staff should just step in, identify the appropriate solution, and we should not have this long drawn out traffic calming process in the middle where it goes to the traffic commission and all the rest of it. But that's the way Beaverton city code is set up. And that's the way the process is set up. I may not agree with it, but I just want to put my neighbors on notice here that you can't just take a shortcut to fixing the problem without going through the process, a getting a staffer willing to intake this B you got to take it to the traffic commission and C it has to go to city council. So that isn't necessarily the process I would set up, but that's the way the process is set up. I will just tell you um, that I did a traffic calming project for another jurisdiction for whom I'm employed. We figured out in two weeks that we needed speed bumps on this street. I got the city traffic engineer approval in two weeks. We got somebody to fund it. It was done. We didn't go through this whole process. But I just think everybody needs to understand that that is the process prescribed by city code. So that's what we have to follow. Thank you, Andrew. And um, just a clarif clarification question for Kelly, Jennifer, and Colette. Uh, did Jabra give you any type of time estimate on when the speed study might be completed? The speed study finished um, on Tuesday of oh. last week, right? Was it last week? Tuesday of last week. And last time it took a, a police officer sent it to me and went over it with me um, and talked to me about it. And that took about, 10 days from when the study, and this was during the holidays too. Um, this was a brown Thanksgiving. And so it was about 10 days later that we received the results of it. So it's been about a week since it finished. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm gonna email Jabra probably tomorrow and get a follow-up now that the speed study's done of next steps um, of where we're at with him and what to do next. So to answer your question, yeah, no, he's never given us a timeline, so to speak, no metrics on that. Um, but we've just based this on previous studies. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, so I, I guess to follow up, um, you all had mentioned that you just attended the recent traffic commission meeting and the traffic commission advised you to uh, reach out to the NAC. <laughs> uh, so My Miles, I have a follow up question for you based on that. What role can the NAC play um, in this moving forward? You know, this is our first meeting and these are pretty tough questions. Um, I appreciate that. 
So um, the NAC could write a letter kind of once the process gets started a little further down, the NAC could write a letter um, as, the official, as the official voice of the neighborhood on behalf of any kind of traffic calming proposals, either for or against them. Um, attending traffic commission and offering your input as chair, um, if the NAC board voted to do that, um, carries weight because the neighborhoods are the official voice. The NACs are the official voice of the neighborhood. Um, I think it kind of depends on how the speed study goes and what the next steps are. But um, it's definitely something we can keep talking about once we get some more information and we don't have to wait till the next meeting in two months to kind of talk about it. We can, um, if Kelly, Colette and Jennifer want to keep us in the loop on what's happening, then we can um, try to lend support if that's what the board wants to do. Okay, thank you, Miles, for that information. Yeah. That. And I think I saw Janet had a hand raised um, a little while ago. Janet, do you still have a question or comment? And her, I just, okay, great. Yeah, um, what I was gonna say is um, I live in Windsor Park, which is on Barrows, uh, entrance is Barrows and 157th. And I don't know if you guys noticed, we have a brick wall along our neighborhood. And the week before you guys got hit, one of our neighbors got hit. And it was also a drunk driver about two o'clock in the morning. And um, so it's not, I know it's far worse where you guys are, but it's uh, apparently not so great where we are either. So um, our um, neighborhood would, would, you know, join you guys in and supporting, you know, trying to get something done. So just let us know. Great, thank you, Janet, appreciate that. Can I jump in? Kelly did an amazing job of doing the statistics and um, Janet's house or her neighbor's house got hit in the same week that two others got hit, including Jennifer's. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say get hit. There was a third one that they almost hit children but didn't they were coming out of the big Alps parking lot they hit a light post and almost hit kids um but what i will say is kelly did a amazing job kind of looking at the statistics and i think it was like something like only 38 percent ish of these accidents are actually happening in the middle of the night mm. and that's astonishing the rest of them are in broad daylight, guys. I think that needs to be looked at and think, sorry, thought about. Thanks, Colette. Um, and I agree that is an astonishing finding from, from Kelly's work. Kelly, did you wanna add anything else to your, uh, to your research on that front? Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you for supporting us and we appreciate any help that you guys are able to offer us. We're definitely ready to see some changes around here. Well, thank you for reaching out and we are happy to help um, and support this however however we can. And uh, Andrew and I can definitely empathize with the frustrations you've been experiencing in this process because uh, we've been experiencing those as well. And Andrew, did you have anything else you wanted to add at this time? Well, um, I guess I do want to flag one thing, maybe um, to be fair to traffic engineering, which is, um, you know, for things like drunk driving and that type of thing, I'm not sure any amount of traffic engineering will necessarily address those. So, um, you know, this may be a combination of a traffic engineering response and a Beaverton Police Department response. Um, so I think we should just be straight up about that. Um, Miles, I thought you did a really nice job of outlining the role of the NAC. You know, I will say that, you know, my perception is that there is really no formal role for the NAC. That certainly doesn't prevent us from writing a letter, but Beaverton Code does not give any standing to NAC officially to take a position or not take a position. That was one of the recommendations 
that I made to the Beaverton City Council was to more formalize the role of NAC in these traffic calming discussions precisely because, um, you know, I think you have to have some level of ge geographic familiarity with the neighborhood. And I think it would make a lot of sense for the NAC to have a formal role um, in these types of projects moving forward. Right now, there's not even a requirement to notify a NAC when there's a traffic calming issue in a neighborhood and that doesn't, um, I think there's room for improvement there. So anyway, those are my final comments on it, but please keep me posted. We'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Keep us posted in the meantime. And um, this is definitely something I wanna track. And Allison, I'm guessing you're sharing my opinion on that. Yes, thanks, Andrew. And we also have a comment from Sharon Dunham in the chat box. She says the, that the BCCI has a traffic calming subcommittee that has been active in bringing about some change in the process. This may be a potential avenue. Sharon, did you, uh, would you like to speak more on that comment? You know, there's been a lot of work around um, Connect Etheridge, uh, Highland, um, various people presenting to the Traffic Commission, and it was quite a task um, to kind of get the conversation going about the process in which there was such a high percentage. And I know to Andrew's point, that's part of the process that you have to go through and endure to create change. However, um, in the BCCI, we have a land use subcommittee. And then just more recently out of that work came a traffic calming subcommittee. Um, and it reports out every month at our BCCI meetings. So you may want to contact Kanet Etheridge in the Highland NAC or one of us in BCCI to have a conversation and try and brainstorm uh, strategies. Sharon, what would be the best way for Kelly, Jennifer, and Colette to get in touch with Kinette? Um, oh, Miles, is that information on the roster um, available? It's not. It's um, internal. Yeah, but okay. um, if you wanted to send me an email, I'd, I would forward it on to her. And then if she responded to you, you know, you'd be good to go. And I'll be talking to her about something else. And so I can definitely bring this up with her. Great, okay. Thanks Sharon for that feedback. And Colette uh, just added, would a petition be helpful for our cause? Colette, can you uh, tell us a little more about what you might be envisioning? So as I kind of mentioned before, um, one of the things that Jennifer Kelly and I have kind of asked for is from the city is to have like crossing lights at all four of the crosswalks around the roundabout. Um, obviously they would be activated by pedestrians that are actually trying to cross um the pushback we got from Jabra was that um, they don't typically do that on streets that are like one-way roads yet just if not even a mile down there's two of them that just got placed within the last two years um so I guess what I'm asking is would a petition asking for these things be helpful? Would it kind of, I don't know, further show that it's not just the three of us that are demanding these things, it's the entire neighborhood. And Colette, are you referring to the flashing um, pedestrian beacons that are that uh, are for the THPRD trail that crosses Barrows? Is that where you're referring to? Yeah, I think so. There's two of them now. Initially, one was put in, which I thought was kind of crazy that they did that one before the other one. The second one was in a, a far more high frequency spot for issues. Um, there's actually a third one that should go in there. Um, that's completely ignored. But then yes, essentially, that's what I'm talking about. 
Okay. Miles, what are your thoughts on, uh, on how a petition plays into all of this? Um, so I think there's kind of two things going on with that idea. Um, so if, if say the traffic um, speed study comes back and it, it's eligible for traffic calming, but there's a process already in place for how that um, is managed. And uh, because there's a process in place, a uh, petition wouldn't change that process. Um, if you want to change the process, that would be more in line with the city council decision. That would be um, a policy decision that the city council would have to direct. Since staff don't make policy, um, the city council does. So, um, how is it changing city policy when there's already these flashing? No, not not changing. There's a process to, to do that. So there's the traffic calming process. Um, so you go through that process and that is how you show support, neighborhood support for these. Um, I would encourage you if, it, if you have neighborhood calming and it gets to traffic commission to encourage your neighbors to write letters of support to the traffic commission. Um, that, that's the most effective way within the process itself. Yeah, so similar to a petition, but it would be more of a, and it can be a form letter that, that you ask them to sign an email back in. Um, I've seen that done before at traffic commission, but it just shows the traffic commission that, hey, there's broad support for this. Um, I guess this my confusion is the double standard. That it's okay a quarter of a mile down the road, but not closer to the roundabout. Right. Well, I think um, it might be a little premature to say that it's not a possibility because it hasn't gone through the process. Um, I can check also if it, if it is not a possibility and why, but my understanding from the process is um, it's kind of open to what the traffic engineer recommends and the process it goes through and what the neighborhood wants there. Um, it goes through that whole process and at the end, everybody votes on what could be the solution. Um, and then it goes to the traffic commission. But let me, I think that's yeah, a good question, Colette. Like, is it even a possibility to get those installed or is that a non-starter? And I, I can try to find, the, find out the answer for you, get a direct answer. I appreciate that because yeah, it, it seems like a double standard since it's allowed further down the road, but not at the roundabout specifically. And yes, the speed slows down towards Progress Ridge, but that's also because there's more speed lights, there's more crosswalks, there's more mm -hmm. traffic calming things in place. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is since it hasn't gone through the process yet, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And so um, just trying to give you some tips to work within the process to try to make it as mo to be as success successful as you can be. And I hope Thank that helps. Thank you, Miles. Appreciate that. And we are over time, but uh, I did see Andrew's hand. Andrew, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just, I'll be super brief on this. I, I agree with everything Miles just said. You know, my one piece of advice, Colette, is don't try to play traffic engineer because um, engineers get very persnickety when members of the public try to say this is the solution. I think completely in alignment with what Miles said is line up your neighbors to be supportive of this traffic calming process if and when it actually comes down the pike. And number two is try to get broad agreement from neighbors on what your objectives are. So I think if you can frame things in terms of objectives, like we want the average speed to be X or we want a safe crossing here, then let the engineers come up with the solution. Because as somebody who leads engineering teams, I'll tell you when you have 
lay people that are not professional engineers saying this is what you should do that just you don't get anywhere with that frame it in terms of objectives that are supported by your neighbors get broad agreement that here's where you want a safe crossing or you know whatever it is and then let the engineers come up with a solution that's just my friendly advice on that thank you andrew all right well thank you again to colette kelly and jennifer for reaching out and bringing this to the NAC and uh, I hope that we can make some successful progress on this front soon. And, um, and we will touch base and uh, look forward to the speed study results, hopefully very soon from the city on this. So thank you again. Thank you. Just real quickly, Austin, I'm gonna drop my email into the chat so you can copy it down and email me. Okay. Thank you, Miles. Yep. Oh, and Jennifer and Andrew, I see two hands. And I was just going to ask you guys, I did put it in the chat, but what are the next steps for us to keep you in the loop as you ask, like, are you going to provide your email addresses for maybe Andrew and Miles? And then we can, do you want us to follow up? Do you want us to attach you on all emails we send to Jabra? Or do you want us to just give you updates on the steps that we're at? I think, uh, I think updates would be great. And I will just add to the email that Kelly started and I'll add uh, Andrew and Miles on that. So um, everyone has everyone's contact information. Does that sound good? Yeah. And thank you guys for taking the time. I know we went thank over you. and we appreciate it taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for reaching out. Andrew, did you have anything else? I see a hand raised or. No. I just, I have a dumb question for Miles. This is my first NAC meeting. So do we use our personal emails or do we get city of Beaverton emails or how does that work? Um, it's your personal email okay. or, or an email that you make up for this, for NAC business. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thank you again to Jennifer Collette and Kelly. Our next items, two items are neighborhood review meetings. So just so that everyone's on the same page. The purpose of a neighborhood review meeting is to provide neighbors and community members an opportunity to become familiar with a development proposal and for the community to identify any issues, voice any concerns, and ask the developer questions. Tonight's neighborhood review meetings are the first steps of the city's land use application process for these two applications. The city expects an applicant to take into consideration the concerns and recommendations of the neighborhood when preparing their application. And the issues, comments, and questions from tonight's meeting will be included in the application the developer submits to the city and will be considered by the city during the application review process. So this is a really great time to raise any of those questions or concerns. Um, on the record as these applications move forward. So the first, uh, the first proposal is for a proposed park off of Shoals Ferry Road between Loon Drive and Southwest 100, 175th. And this is being presented by Stephen from OTAC. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Stephen is here. He had a conflict and joined us a little later, so I'm going to take the lead on the presentation. My name is Lee Alligood, and I work on the planning team with Stephen. And there is just one of me. The other is Steve Dixon. With the team. I believe Gabe is going to share a presentation. Yep. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead and get started. Well, um, yeah, so this is the South Cooper Mountain Heights Public Park, um, phase one, uh, which acts working with Lennar uh, Homes and THPRD to uh, bring this park to, uh, to the people. So um, David Forrest is a representative from Lennar. I'm a landscape architect, Gabriel Cruz. I work for OTAC. Um, land use planner, Stephen uh, McAtee, who's on the call, and Lee Alligood also helps out. Um, on a lot of this stuff too, that we work a lot in tandem. Um, so engineer Brad Swear, Jim, he couldn't make it tonight. So if there are some engineering specific questions, we'll have to kick that back and, and get back to people. 
And then Tim Bonin has joined us too from THPRD uh, and he's been our, our design consultant on this. Um, but the project background, um, it's part of the South Cooper Hound, South Cooper Mountain Heights PUD uh, approved in January, 2016. It's a track that was um, slotted to be a public park, uh, included in phase three, and that's the phase that's being, uh, I think it's starting construction, if not now, very soon. Um, and the, yeah, okay, so the site infrastructure began in September, 2021. Um, so we'll get to some, some uh, images here in a second. Uh, the process for this is that the THPRD board will review the park on March 9th. Um, it's a type three conditional use application in the R5 zone and a new type two or three design review application for public park in the R5 zone. Um, phase two design will be determined through THPRD's master planning process. That is a complete separate process. So this is, um, we're, we're saying this is a phase one to keep um, to get something started and then GHP is going to come in and um, take it all the way through. So this is the location here uh, and we've got uh, Barrows Road in the South Cooper, Mountain, South Cooper Mountain Heights neighborhood to the north, um, Oyster Catcher to the south and Bittern on the east and then on the west is the um, vegetated corridor that we aren't going to be touching at all. Uh, so this is the phase three plan. And as you can see here, our park is within phase three, um, but with this uh, submittal and with, with this phase, um, it's basically being graded and these retaining walls are being included. So that's our existing condition. So the design that we have uh, come up with um, is basically to try to maximize future uses or um, you know, flexibility moving forward. So what we're at, what we have here is um, basically a, a path that goes through from Barrows um, down to uh, Bittern on the east uh, and with a play structure tucked in in the southwest corner. And so this area um, in the southwest is actually elevated. So there's two rows of retaining walls with stairway connections to the trail to the west and to oyster catcher to the south. Um, and with this, uh, we've had um, THPRD weigh in on play equipment for this area. And I think there are a couple options that we're looking at for that. Um, uh, I think that some of the other items that'll be in the park, uh, trash cans, benches, racks, will have uh, fall protection at the top of the walls. There will be, um, a fence along Barrows and along Bittern to keep uh, you know kids from running out into the street uh, with a planting with a planting bed as well to kind of buffer that. Um, and we're really trying to just maximize this lawn area in hopes that you know when THPRD comes back, they can take this to the next phase and add other things. That it's going to be a, a big community outreach um, process, and so there'll be a lot of time to to talk about um, what other items or what other um, amenities might be in this park. Um, so yeah, as I was just saying, the phase two design, uh, public engagement survey is a lot more. This is um, uh, basically just the, the first phase and there'll be another land use. Gabriel, yes. so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but would yes. you mind resizing your um, the portion you're screen sharing because it's cut off on our end? Uh -oh. Okay, let me see. Maybe I'll just um, see if that can, is that better? Uh, well, yeah, now, we don't, now, now we, we don't, don't have a screen. Anything. Okay. <laughs> well, I apologize for interrupting. I just want to make no, sure. That's okay. I just want to make sure everyone can see what's what's on your yeah, I just spoke up. Yeah, uh, while we're pausing here, if you would like to receive information about the upcoming land use application or the park planning process, go ahead and put your contact information in the chat. Is this any better? Because <laughs> all I can see is what's on my screen. Is that better? Um, yes, we, we okay. can see all the text. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next steps uh, basically are um, the THPRD review in March. Uh, Randy submitted uh, submittal to the city of Beaverton in late March, possibly early April. Planning commission hearing June, July. 
um, permitting this summer and fall and then um, starting construction in the fall of this year. And so I'll go back to the graphic and we can take some questions at this point. And Gabriel, is it possible to zoom in um, the yeah. scale at the bottom since we're on the graphic right now? I think so. Great. Thank you. Is that a little better? Sorry. I'm trying to. And so, Gabriel, just to clarify uh, that I understood correctly, you're saying that. THPRD will be doing a separate community survey in addition? Right, so correct? this, this right, we're calling this phase one um, and it's, it's to get a park in, in, in the neighborhood right away. You know, Lennar is gonna build this for THPRD and hand it over to THPRD. So it's, we're, we wanna have, you know, um, it's gonna have a playground, it's gonna have a lot of turf and it's gonna have some seating. And then THPRD and, and Tim can jump in here too if he wants from TH Parity or Gary to talk about that process. But um, uh, that will be a completely separate, you know, a lot of community engagement surveys, et cetera. And do you have an estimate on when the TH PRD survey, where that falls into the timeline that you had shown at the end? Uh, Tim or Gary, can you guys speak to sure. that? Sure. Yeah. There was, um, so with this park, this is being an, an interim park for us. And as this is being presented tonight to the community as really a first phase at Lennar Homes, as a developer would like to develop this park on behalf of THPRD. Um, and in doing so, what they get is service um, system development charges credits. For every home they build, they have to pay into system development charges. So they could use those credits, apply those credits to either build a park or a trail in the community. And so that, that's what Lennar is proposing here. And because there's very few people living in the area right now, we've actually brought a, this interim park to the board several years ago um, because if, there weren't a lot of people in the community yet, but the developer at that time wanted to have a park in place to have some amenities for the community as people started to move in. Um, and that's what Lennar is doing now. So we're familiar with this project. And what we would do as far as a survey with this is uh, give the community a few options on the playground equipment. So Lennar has a set budget, but um, the, in the area is identified on, that, on the plan in front of you. But what we would do is look at maybe two different, two different styles of play equipment that could fit into the area. Uh, we've done this in South Cooper Mountain uh, a few months ago. We had some success working with OTEC on that. and just provided some 3D models for the community. We put it up on a survey. They could pick the style of uh, the types of play equipment they wanted and the, and the, and the types, types of play equipment they wanted, different, different types of amenities. And then we, then we use that to, in the final uh, selection of the equipment for when those parks are being built. And Tim, um, there, the phase ahead. two at some point, that'll be concept plan through THPRD's kind of more traditional. Correct. Yeah. And that will be the second phase of the park. Um, the plan was when the community was built out and there was more people uh, available that lived around it so we could have more, more input from the neighbors who lived around the park and then to better identify what the needs would be for the park. So that would be our second phase. And that's probably the next year or so. A couple of years. Not short term. So we have some comments in the chat. Uh, it looks like both Lydia and Shauna have concerns on pet waste, and they are asking, will there be plenty of pet waste stations at the entry points? And Shauna echoes that sentiment. Uh, pet waste not being cleaned up is a huge problem in this area. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Part of this would be to provide the appropriate um, site furnishings, as Gabe mentioned, for the park. You know, to have the conveniences such as park benches and bike racks, uh, drinking fountain, but as well as trash receptacles and uh, pet waste dispensers. Uh, typically, they're at at the entry points of the park. Um, and of course, once this park gets further along, um, we develop a budget for it as well as far as our maintenance, so that we can um, have the appropriate 
level of maintenance uh, once THPRD takes over the park. Okay, Shauna has a comment. Drainage from rain into our property has been problematic through this process developing the land. Please make sure drainage does not affect our property. I'm not sure where Shauna lives relative to the park, but generally once the public infrastructure improvements go in, that situation should improve because the developer is putting in stormwater management um, infrastructure. And the developer is actually here as an attendee and may have additional um, things to say. Uh, but yeah, we, um, and the city holds us to very high standards for stormwater management and um, stormwater drainage on the site. And I'll say I, I reviewed this plan with our uh, civil engineer who's created it. We've got drains that take any excess stormwater into uh, designated storm ponds, uh, the big one here to the east. There's, I don't know if you can see on here, there's a little drain coming up from the right. And also we'll have a couple other ones from on the south here that will go um, take water away. So it, it is designed to get that water where it's supposed to be. Shauna, did you, uh, would you like us to activate your mic? Or did you have any other further questions on on the drainage front that you'd like to add to the chat box? Um, I just want to reiterate that we live on the fence line with the field where the houses are going in and we got flooded and our yard got full of mud. So whatever OTEC can do to prevent that from happening when everything gets in, that would be great. Because right now we're dealing with um, a muddy yard and lots of water. And they did come in and do some remediation, but they have to come in um, after they get done with the field out there um, and come fix what was damaged when all the rainwater ran into our property. Because we're, we're the house that goes on the dip of the fence line. And so we just got inundated with water from all the rain that we've had. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, as I mentioned, the developer is on the phone too. So he's definitely hearing that from you as well. And I'll pass that along to our engineering team also just to reiterate, you know, what we've heard tonight. Thank you, Shauna, for providing your feedback on that front. Yep. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Teresa. She asks, what measures will be put in place to protect the two homes that abut next to this proposed park? Will this create significant increase in noise from park goers, et cetera? That's a good question. Um, you know, we do have a landscape buffer that surrounds it. The park is also raised. Um, and I've really tried to, we're, we're gonna do a lot of planting in the area between uh, the homes and uh, the, the more used play areas. And so that's why the, the play area is pushed over to the um, Southwest so that it's not right up against someone's home. Um, we're gonna you know, try to buffer with landscaping. Uh, and also, you know, there's also gonna be physical buffer or physical barriers there too with the wall and fence. So I have a question. Oh, Teresa has a follow-up. Um, she asks, how high are these walls and fences? Good question. Um, I think we've got a, if I remember correctly, the lower wall is six feet high and the one above it is three feet high. So there, it's terraced. So on the Southwest corner, I think there might be nine feet of grade change. And um, behind the homes, I think it's about six feet. And we'll do evergreen um, buffer planting there so people aren't like, you know, right in your backyard, basically. <laughs> we, know that, we don't want that either. Teresa, did you have any further follow-up questions? And, and feel free to, to unmute yourself also.
Okay, Teresa uh, does not have any further questions at this time and sends her thanks. And thank you to Tim for putting, there's a link for everyone in the chat. Yeah, um, so we don't have uh, this project on there yet, but we did the, the previous project, actually the one you're gonna see Blackbird Farms coming up next. So if we, when, when we do do a survey for this, for the play equipment, we'll have that on this website where people can participate in selecting the types of play equipment that'll be at this park. Great. And Tim, could I ask you to kindly uh, resend that link and choose to send it to everyone so oh, that yes, I so see that all it. so that all of our <laughs> attendees. Panel. Let yes. me do that one more time. Great, thank you. Sure. And we have a comment from Amy. Um, she's saying that earlier. Uh, an earlier plan was a constructed berm instead of the retaining wall. And she has a link um, to that referenced plan. And she's asking what the reason was for the change. That was a great question. <laughs> I, as far as I remember, and there you go, Steve might know, he, um, he's been doing this project for longer than I have. Yeah. When I got here, there were walls. So I'll let Steve talk. Right. No, I think I think part of that was driven by two factors. One, the ultimate final design of of Barrows as it runs by the park on the north, and also the desire to have a flat, usable lawn area as large as possible. And in doing that, and and making that. Um, accessible, making the pathway accessible, um, and the play structure area accessible from the street. Um, and I believe my recollection was that was necessitated that the whole area in the southwest corner certainly um, had to be lifted slightly so that the open lawn area was actually usable. And that was, I think, the primary reason to make to make the usable park area as flat as possible and as large as possible. Amy, do you have any follow up questions on that front? Okay, it looks like Amy does not have any follow up there, but Amy, feel free to unmute yourself or or add that to the chat. Okay, great. Uh, Amy has no further follow up. Are there any other questions? Uh, Kyle is asking, is the upper right corner also a park entry? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I did leave a, um, a gap in the uh, fence and planting there uh, to allow pedestrian entry. It's not going to be an accessible entry, but um, it, it's going to it'll allow movement at least from the corner. Okay, and I think I also saw a hand from Andrew. Andrew, did you have a Question or comment? Yeah, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. You would think I'd have the Zoom thing done after two years of the pandemic, but something weird was going on and I couldn't communicate with you guys. So I signed off and signed back on. <clears throat> I just had a simple question, but I'm assuming THPRD is ultimately going to own this park asset once it's built. So assuming that's the case, um, I would want our NAC to continue to be informed of the progress and the public feedback, but I would really be looking to THPRD to be taking the lead on, you know, master planning the park, identifying the elements that you'd want to see, and then of course doing all the review to make sure that items like drainage got addressed. I'd really be looking to THPRD to be taking the lead on that and certainly doing the outreach with the developer and the property owners on that front. But I appreciate this being brought forward for us to see. 
Thanks, Andrew. And on the topic of water, will this park be connected at all to the purple pipe system that's going in nearby for irrigation purposes? Yes, that is a requirement of the neighborhood. So it will be purple pipe. All the irrigation will all be purple pipe. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. Yep. And let's see, Teresa, um, she's asking how long will we have to, how long will the construction be going on for those who live nearby and it'll be affecting daily life? Uh, Teresa, I, I paraphrase. <laughs> that, is a, that is a good question. Um, hmm. <laughs> Anyone have any idea? Uh, well, we're hoping to start in the fall and there isn't a lot of infrastructure here. I, I can't give a, you know, a, a great window here, but because it's really just paving and planting for the most part and some, some playground, it shouldn't be, you know, it's not going to be years in the making here. It should, you know, it will take some time. Um, it all, you know, it all depends on scheduling and everything else, but. I would say months rather than years, but yeah. right now, as you all have probably heard, um, everyone is very busy. Contractors are busy. Materials are difficult to get. So that's kind of extending timelines beyond what are typical. We're kind of um, going day by day <laughs> to see to see who's available to do the work and when we can begin. Okay, Colette has um, added a concern that another park is being added when there are, are already traffic issues in this area. Well, we don't foresee um, a lot of people driving to this park. This is really a neighborhood park. So it's, it's meant for people in the neighborhood, pedestrians. You know, there is some street parking around, but um, this is this is really a park for the neighborhood, so it's it, it's meant for people within walking distance to come to this park. It's not a regional draw, um, so I, and, you know if I'm speaking on a on a, on a uh, turn here, Tim, let me know. But I, I believe that's the case. Yeah, that that's the criteria of a neighborhood park, so it it won't have a field um, where we where if it has program sports will require parking where people are going to come to it. So yes, yeah, this, is, this is meant to be used by the local neighborhood. And I think it's helpful to um, mention that the, when the plan unit development was approved back in 2016, this park was part of it. And so all the traffic modeling that occurred at that time included all of the improvements that are part of the PD. But we don't expect, yeah. And if people do drive here, there's gonna be very limited places for them to park on the street. Is there any public transit access for this park since it'll be a public park under THPRD? I think the no, nearest transit is to the east a bit on Shoals Ferry. The nearest transit stop is um, Murray and Shoals Ferry, which is a very long distance away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think TriMat does have a long-term service plan to potentially extend service in the vicinity of Mountain, Mount, uh, Mountainside High School. But that's a long ways off, and I wouldn't expect that to happen for quite some time. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not aware of any long-term plans for transit service on 175th. I think the closest it would ever get is Shoals Ferry out to the vicinity of Mountainside High School. Yeah, TriMet is planning to extend service out to the South Cooper Mountain Main Street area, which is, I think, our next agenda item. Um, but it is, like Andrew said, several years out at this point. I think it was planned to happen in 2023, 2024, but um, just things have extended. And so if there were a stop, it would be on Schultz Ferry Road. But it is connected to the multi-use trail, the biking and walking trail and all of the other infrastructure that's by in the development. Okay, are there any other uh, questions or comments or concerns from anyone tonight? Looks like there is a question on hand. Oh, Kurt. I'm sorry, it didn't show up on my on my view. 
No, no worries. Um, just with Colette chiming in, um, I think the road to the north of the park has been referred to as Barrows a couple times, but that's a road that doesn't exist yet. Is it going to be like an extension of Barrows coming off of Loon or I guess I'm just confused why it's got the same name. And I think it's leading to confusion. It will be an people. extension of Barrows Road. So the permits that the city has issued now for site development will include extension of that road north of okay. the city. So Barrows will end at Shoals Ferry, be loon for like a thousand feet and turn back into Barrows. I think that's right. And then it moves uh, west to the rest of Central Mountain Heights. Okay. Yeah. That's all I had, so. And that was established with the, the South Cooper Mountain concept plan way back when. So um, Lennar will be building a good portion as part of their development. All right, great. Okay, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns at this time? And I know Tim put the link, the THPRD link, um, but Lee, is there another contact, a direct contact info that you could share with attendees if they, if they weren't able to be here tonight and they watch the meeting later? Is there a direct contact info so people could reach out with questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Stephen McAtee, who's here listening, um, is a good contact person and his email is stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N dot M-C-A-T-E-E -E at otac.com. And Gabriel Cruz is another, and the convention is the same. So first name, last name at otac.com. So either of them can assist you with questions you might have or clar more clarification. Okay, thank you, Lee. And would you um, be able to kindly uh, put those in writing in the chat box I certainly for, can. for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And before we move on to the next one, Colette has one more question for our um, applicants tonight. She asks, where are all the 3,000 3, plus new homes going to shop? Yeah, so um, those of you who are familiar with the South Cooper Mountain concept plan, um, there's a whole area west of 175th, west of the high school, that's zoned for commercial use, and that has gone through land use approval um, to apply commercial zoning to those sites. There's no development proposed at, the, at the, this moment, but that's where the commercial development in South Cooper Mountain is focused. That was partly at the time to avoid um, competition with Park Ridge shopping area. Sorry, where is that location again? It's west of the high school. Thank you. It's the Bartholomew property here, the Blackbird Farms, those, those properties over there. Leah, I'm sorry, the audio cut out. Could you repeat? Um, uh, could you please repeat what that area is? Uh, I know you said it's west of the high school, but uh, the the name it's being referred to as on the developer or on the city. Yeah, planning. well, and that's actually part of the next um, presentation. So it's a South Cooper Mountain Main Street site, which was formerly the Bartholomew site, and then the Blackbird Farm site, just to the west of it. Okay, thank you. And Colette is as a follow up. Have any stores or brands applied? I can I answer that question. All righty. Okay, so if there are no further questions um, at this time, we will move on to the, or did our uh, presenters have anything else they would want to add? I guess just on? in terms of a wrap up, so the next steps here, as you mentioned, we'll put together notes and send them over to you, Dr. Baldwin. And um, then you can let us know if you have any edits. And then the next step will be to make the formal submittal to the city of Beaverton. And so those of you who live within I believe 500 feet of the park will get a mailed notice and so you'll have another opportunity to make formal comments or ask questions at that time. And then there's a public hearing. So there's another opportunity yet for input. So we're at the very beginning of the process and there's quite a bit of opportunity to engage. Thank you, Lee. And thank you to our attendees for 
um, your questions and concerns and um, so that this all is taken into consideration uh, with this application as they move forward in, in the city's process. So thank you. All right, so it looks like there's nothing else on this item. We will move to the next neighborhood review meeting <laughs> item, which is also a park. And this is west of 175th Avenue. And this is Lee uh, Alligood again from OTAC. So you have kind of the same crew for this one. Um, and so if you have any questions, this might answer some of the questions that have come up in this discussion. So I'm going to share a presentation and I'm gonna hope that it um, shows up the way it should, but uh, just let me know if it's, if it's not showing entirely. And how does that appear? Uh, we do see it, but Lee, could you um, maybe shrink it a little bit? We can't see all the, the, the text is going out of the margins. Yeah, that's so strange. Because um, I can see it on mine. I don't know. It might have to do with the size of your screen because yeah. I have a large screen, so it might just okay. be I see it great on mine. Okay, I'm I'm odd woman out. Sorry about that. Let's <laughs> Um, well, I will make it a little smaller just so you can, this is a PDF, so it's a little easier to manage. So this is um, on the west side of 175th, that's what's called South Cooper Mountain Main Street and Blackbird Farms. And this is also um, a new park and it's got also a THPRD involvement in this park. And this is a little further along. So the project team for this one, we have a different client here, which Camper Development Partners is the developer and the property owner. And I am the planner on this one. Gabe is the landscape architect here as well. Our site designer, Steve Dixon, and then Tim is also the project manager. So we thought it made sense to bring both of these projects to you tonight and let you see them in context. And so the project background, I am gonna make it a little bit bigger. So these are two separate developments that were approved in 2020 and 2021. The South Cooper Mountain Main Street was approved in November 2020, and then Blackbird Farms followed in July 2021. The Blackbird Farms included what we call Tract C, which was intended to be ultimately a park, but was kind of a placeholder at that time. The THPRD board has reviewed this plan, and they approved it in January 12th, and this did go through the park district's concept planning, master planning process. So there was a survey online that some of you may have seen or received and there is a pretty robust public engagement effort. And so what we're proposing to do now sorry, is, is to revise the South Cooper Mountain Main Street parcel two to accommodate a new public park. And so that requires a replat application. We also need a conditional use application for a public park in a residential zone. And so that requires planning commission hearing and a neighborhood meeting with you all. And then there's a new design review application for that park as well. So those are the items that we'll be taking to the city. So this is, um, so we were just talking about a site just off the screen right here, here's 175th, Shoals Ferry Road, and here's the high school. So this is the commercially zoned site uh, that is called South Cooper Mountain Main Street. And then this is an area that was zoned commercial as part of the Blackbird Farms planned unit development. So this is a contiguous area of commercial development. South Cooper Mountain Main Street is largely approved for multifamily residential development, but there is a site here that has conceptual approval for commercial uses. And um, when I say I can't answer the question, it's both because I'm not really in the know and also because anything, any conversations that are happening are very preliminary and not ready yet. So the park is approximately here and you can see it overlaps this Blackbird Farms and South Cooper Mountain Main Street. And that's why um, we have kind of this land use process that we need to go through. So this is South Cooper Mountain Main Street. So it's three parcels. This is Mountainside Way, which will be widened. Um, currently it provides access to the high school. This project is gonna make it wider and build the other half of the road and then connect it back to the west. And this was, I think, road 6B in the South Cooper Mountain concept plan. 
and then Shoals Ferry is here to the south. So this is the future commercial area. This is a tree park plaza that PHPRD is also going to take ownership of once it's constructed. So that's been approved. What we're looking at here is um, this area in the northwest corner. We have tract C that was approved with Blackbird Farms, and then we have lot two that was approved with South Cooper Mountain Main Street. And what we're proposing is to reorient the lot two improvements, make this park a more rectilinear shape, and then go through the design review and conditional use process to approve the design. So this will be as it is, and this will be a new tract that will be created. And in terms of the park design, what was approved with Blackbird Farms was an interim, again, condition, which was essentially open lawn area. There's a little um, table here and a pathway into the park. And this was uh, intended to be open space, but not extremely structured or formal. So what's proposed with this design, and this is what you would have seen if you got the survey online, there were three options available that Tim can touch on if people are interested. The winning concept was a nature exploration area. And so Gabe, do you want to walk us through a little bit uh, what's happening here? Sure. Um, yeah, so like we said, um, we worked with THPRD to, and we had a couple of concepts that were up for survey. And so what's happening here is um, we've got a play area to the right, which is a nature play area. It's kind of lighter brown. And the same thing over on the left hand side, it's, a, it's another nature play area, playground. Um, and then in the middle, it's what's called a nature exploration area. And in that space, it's, it's a lot more of kind of um, loose, uh, exploratory play, there'll, there'll be, um, you know, uh, some mounds, some some felled logs from some of the trees we had around, you know, even some some pieces of wood to build things with a little bit for the kids to try to like, you know, set things up. And um, so that's really kind of almost like going out in a trail, hopefully. Um, and then in between uh, in there, we've also got some, some steep um, stones for like a little amphitheater area and um, all the all the playground pieces then will have a nature theme to it. Um, there's also a fence, you know, on the north side uh, because that's a um, uh, that's a collector, I believe. So we want to, that's a requirement of a fence in between. We'd have that either way. Uh, and then there'll be a landscape buffer in between um, the park and the, the new uh, parking lot to the south. And um, so we'll have some tables, um, drinking fountain, you know, um, some uh, bike racks, benches, some of the normal kind of kind of parts that you'll see in all the parks. Okay. Thank you, Gabe. And I skipped right over Steve and what's happening with um, the changes to lot two. And I don't know, Steve, if you want to walk us through a little bit of what's happening here. Yeah, you just just skipped right by me there, right? <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> well, basically, I mean the the I mean the essential point is that these two projects, two halves of the park, had to be separate land use approvals. So we had to start with this in the existing property line. You can see which kind of heads off at an angle. So we had to provide sufficient parking and open space area for the Main Street development. And then with the Blackbird Farms development, we were able to consolidate that open space in the park area. And in so doing, make the parking for the multifamily developments on Main Street more efficient, provide the same amount of parking, and provide the the same efficient points of access to streets. And that about sums it up. Thank you, Steve. And this area is different from the area east of 175th in that many of these developments are under construction, but very few of these homes are occupied. So it is, um, we're in this case trying to get ahead of the residents and the residential um, development to provide these park infrastructure improvements so that they're ready when people move in. So it's a little bit of a different sequence. 
than we had on the other side of the road there. And so in terms of what's happening next, um, we're looking to submit land use to the city of Beaverton in the spring. And so we're waiting uh, just to, to have this meeting to hear from this group and then finalize our designs and submit there. There will be a planning commission hearing and they'll render a decision uh, estimated this summer. And then we'll go into permitting and then park construction is slated for summer 2023. So not this coming summer, but the following summer once the infrastructure has been built to allow the contractors to actually get to that park. And so I believe that's all we have. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions about this one. Thank you, Lee. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, Joanne Shelby has a question. Will there be benches or seating for parents slash grandparents to sit while kids play? Good question. Yes, there will be. Um, there, I, let's see, I think there's one on the west side, basically um, on the west side of the west side of the walk. Under the trees here. <laughs> yeah, under the trees. There's another, and these are just kind of like your standalone benches, you know, off the shelf things. There will also be a lot of other um, stones and, and things around that you can sit on too, but we do have a number. Uh, I think there's another bench around um, uh, just in the middle, kind of by that nature exploration area in that space. And then there are picnic tables over to the right next to the drinking fountain um, where we have steps coming in off of uh, um, the the ramps to the right. So yeah, there's there'll be plenty of seating. Thank you. And uh, could you also clarify on, so on the left side of the graphic, there is that green, um, it almost looks like you're looking at the top of a baby grand piano. Yes. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, this is actually a newer development and so our, our graphic uh like like lee said we're still we're moving forward with this with this concept and i think one of the things we're going to end up doing is adding that portion into the park because um it the way the the parking lot worked out um, that area we we're able to make it more open space and so what we're going to probably end up doing is taking that little leg where it says stairs there and pulling that further south so we can bring more of that area into the park. Um, but this is just a little bit older of a graphic. And that's, of course, pending approval from THPRD and the agreement on that end. So we're, we're moving ahead with that design concept as conversations are happening in the background. Great. What's interesting about these parks is that we're meeting the city of Beaverton's design standards, but THPRD also has their own standards for neighborhood parks and maintenance requirements. And it's, it's a pretty interesting um, balancing act to make sure that we're picking all of those boxes and that everyone has what they need out of these parks. And uh, Gabriel, you had mentioned that there was an amphitheater included, right? Right. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that and, and what that might actually be able to accommodate? Well, it's it's going to be very loose. So it's it's probably going to be a couple levels of seat holders. And so it'll be, you know, a place to come out and have a seat. And I don't I don't picture this being programmed with a band at any point. You know, this is a nature park. So it's it's really more of a kind of a play space for kids to climb around and you know if they want to get out there and show their grandparents a play that they worked on. And they can do that, but it's, I could real picture this being, you know, programmed with, you're not gonna see Storm Large on here in a concert at any time. It, it, do you envision that it could possibly be used for, um, for maybe like a nature education? Um, yeah, it could be an outdoor classroom yeah. of sort, for sure. And, you know, that's part of what I think is so cool about this park is that it's, um, it's, it's a way to bring nature kind of closer and more accessible to people. Um, and so I think that's a, definitely, you know, that's the way we've seen these things used in the past also as, as a place to stop off and, and talk about, the, you know, nature and, and the processes. 
Thank you. Uh, Shauna has a question in the chat. She asks, what measures are being done with the wildlife that is being pushed out of their homes with all of the construction? Mostly deer that live in the area and a lot of them have been killed by cars on the road. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, most of this area that, we're, that is being developed, we're not, we're not going into the natural resource area, the designated resource area. And so there's still gonna be a lot of, um, there, there's, a, there's gonna be ways for these animals to make their way through the spaces. Uh, you know, these are, Blackbird Farms is a, is a working farm. Um, you know, these are areas that um, have been used for agriculture and not necessarily a uh, natural resource. Uh, there are animals that will be displaced, but they're also, we're also preserving a lot of um, natural open space on these projects. Yeah, it's not shown on these graphics, but Blackbird Farms to the West, there's, maybe Steve can give me the acreage. It's a significant part of the site that is preserved and it's um, vegetated, there's trees, there's wetlands up there. There's a natural trail system, but there's also, you know, a pond. And so the idea is that there will be this refuge um, nearby for animals. And a, and a developing and preserved significant wildlife corridor. Right. Mm -hmm. Joanne Shelby uh, shares the concern Shauna voiced in the chat. And uh, Joanne writes, please be aware there are deer, coyotes, and I have seen one cougar coming through by the creek since I moved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually when we, we did the project to the west, which is the ridge, and at that time, the planning commission requested essentially a wildlife corridor easement through the northern part of that site to allow connectivity between the natural areas and sites to the west. So there's certainly a lot of thought being given to that question. Shauna also asked, will there be signage anywhere? Um, related to the natural area or to, um, yes. And I think Gabe and Tim can talk more to that. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have park signage, um, you know, basically uh, what kind of things are allowed in the park. Also park signage saying what this park, you know, this is a park, big park sign up front and then also some park rule signs within the park. Um, you know, as we talk about some of the natural resource areas, uh, there will be signs, you know, stating that this is a natural resource area. Um, people aren't supposed to come in here. And there will be signs saying these are portions of the natural area you can go in. So that it's going to be, there will be fencing and um, signage clearly denoting where people can and can't go uh, in those, in those uh, vegetated natural resource areas. Shauna has a hand raised. Go ahead, Shauna. So I was traumatized with the deer that was hit on Shoalsbury. It was a mama deer. She lived in the wetlands that um, Lennar, uh, the first development they put in in 2013. And uh, she ended up, she was thrown into the wetland field and was left there instead of transportation coming and getting her. And the Beaverton police were involved and did not um, dispose of her when they got her off the road. Um, so anyway, I had called the city to see if there was anything that they could do to put signage because apparently there was another one hit up off of uh, Shoals Ferry and Blackbird in the middle of the day. And I know I've seen a bunch of deer um, on the road going to Sherwood on Roy Rogers. So if there's any way that the city or whoever could put up signage that there are deer in the area, that mm -hmm. might be helpful so people are more aware. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's very traumatizing when you're taking your dog for a walk and you see a dead deer laying on the road stinking that no one, especially in a neighborhood. So, and there's a huge herd that we just saw. There was like 20 of them up on the tree line where Lennar and that the first park we talked about is going up. Um, they were up there this weekend. So 
there's a huge herd out here. So if signages could go up that there's deer in the area, that would probably be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can certainly mention that to the well in the county um, in charge of Shoals Ferry Road. That's a concern. One thing that might assist with that, which isn't part of this project, is part of other projects, is that as Shoals Ferry Road is widened and built out, and you can see that happening at some point west of 175th, the steep speed limit is being reduced. Um, so that won't go all the way, but it might help somewhat. Thank you, Shauna, for voicing that concern. Yep. Shauna, did you have anything else to add at this time? No, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a question on the rendering. I see that there's a trash enclosure uh, kind of in that bottom third. Um, will that be screened off or, or how will that look? Yeah, typically they would be CMU, is that right, Steve? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, yeah, they will be, they have to be totally visually screened mm -hmm. from certainly even on-site and off-site, so yes. And so that would include from the park. And there's also yeah. quite, a bit, quite a bit of heavy vegetation along this boundary um, that will provide a sense of privacy. And, well, not privacy, but <laughs> separation from the parking lot. Thank you. And another um, clarification question on the rendering, the all of the green circles that we see throughout is that indicating shade coverage or does that indicate something else? Um, yeah, so the lighter colored uh, circles, those are gonna be shade trees. And then in the nature exploration area, we're proposing to put in some um, fairly large evergreen trees in those spaces. They'll go in a little bit bigger because they are gonna be closer to people, you know, kids running around. And so the idea is we'll try to protect those as they establish and then we'll have this nice evergreen kind of grove to, to play under, you know, as things grow tall. And will this park also be irrigated with the purple pipe system? It will. It really will. All right, Colette has added a comment to the chat. Um, She's also voicing the concern um, that the natural wildlife animals are not cared about. Colette, is there anything else you would like to add on that front for the applicants? So it does seem that that is a shared community concern. Yes, I'm definitely hearing that and I've taken some notes. Great. And uh, Colette has added um, the concern of our, um, of the natural wildlife and resources as the homes are going in, uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you are gonna start to see, I think the Ridge has quite a few homes that are built, but um, others are gonna start coming online. It's certainly gonna be something that we'll need to think about as that development is happening. Yes, that is uh, definitely a shared community concern. Are there any questions, further questions, comments, or concerns at this time from anyone here tonight? And Lee, is there, uh, what, what would be the best way for people to learn about this project and get in touch with you all if they were not able to be here tonight? Yes, so I'll put my email in the chat. And if those of you in attendance received a notice, then my email is in there as well, but I'm guessing that um, there are a few of those here. So I just put it in the chat and then, 
I'll need to ask, I think, for a transcript of the chat from you so we can make sure to put people's contact information in our materials so we can keep them updated on what's going on. And thank you so much. I know you stayed quite a bit longer than your typical meeting time. So really appreciate the, the opportunity to speak with you all. Well, the, the land use uh, component is very important. Mm -hmm. So um, appreciate you providing your email so people can get in touch. And did, was there a website link um, similar to the other park proposal that people could visit to learn about what's going on? Just to say the, the one we have is, um, is our own just to support projects that come through the district. Um, developers may have their own separate website themselves. I'm not sure if Lenar is, but um, like if you went to that South Cooper Mountain website, you'd actually see this project on there where we did the um, survey mm -hmm. the play the play areas. So the same site would have. Okay, so so folks can access that same link mm -hmm. to learn about both projects. Okay, okay, great. And Shauna, I see you have a hand raised. Is that um, just a, a souvenir hand for us from from earlier, or do you, do you have an additional comment? No, there are no additional comments right now. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you to our presenters tonight, um, and thank you very much to all of our community members and neighbors for attending and and asking questions and voicing your concerns, so that all of this can be taken in, into consideration um, moving forward. I, I really appreciate that and, and we really appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. All right, so if there's nothing else from our applicants, we will move forward. Thank you all. And our next item thank is, you. thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Kevin Teeter, who is joining us from the Central Beaverton NAC. And he is presenting on a project called the Year of Trees. Hi, Kevin. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Uh, good to see you all. Um, again, my name is Kevin. I'm from the Central Beaverton Neighborhood Association Committee. And I think uh, we share a lot of the similar concerns that, that I've heard from Allison and that I've heard from a lot of you all here tonight, too, about loss of habitat, uh, tree coverage, just some of the natural amenities that really make Beaverton great that we're really struggling to keep. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to walk through one of the uh, project advocacy ideas that we're wanting to push city council on um, and city leadership on. It's called a year of trees. So this really came out of the out of the background of having development proposals come before us fairly frequently and feeling like we were always playing defense defense about um, trying to protect the trees that we've got and never having a chance to really say like, all oh, right, we're, we're gaining some really great tree canopy. We're gaining some really great natural habitat and some, some great animal habitat. And so we just wanted to flip the script a little bit and be like, what can we do to actually make a progressive change for the better regarding our tree canopy to protect us from heat islands and to give us a more livable city for for humans and creatures alike. And so this is where, what, what's come out of it. And I'll share my screen here. Um, and I'll try to be pretty efficient because um, I'm tired and I'm sure most of you are tired too. Okay, um, does that work? Cool, okay. So we'll go through it pretty quickly and then get some questions from you all. But my ultimate hope is that um, well, the Central Beaverton NAC and the Highland NAC are both writing a letter to the city leadership and, and signing it together and saying, hey, this is the direction we really want to go in. And we would love to work with you to come up with some really great ideas to make this happen. Uh, so I would love to get the Neighbor Southwest NAC um, vote of support as well. So the, the idea here is uh, that we are really encouraging the city to to plant 10,000 trees over the next year. So that's one for every 10 residents. Um, so that would be throughout the city. And that would be trees planted on private land at people's yards or in public grounds and parks and or along streets, like any of that counts, but we're really making a measurable goal that we can really pursue. Like we want more shade, we want, we want more just 
comfortable land to be able to live in. Um, so then at the end of the year, like we want to be able to look back and say like, hey, we actually did it. We planted 10,000 trees or these policies we created led to 7,000 more. And then we did these community plantings, like being able to show the this measurable data with like maps of where the trees were planted, I think could just, it could be a really meaningful demonstration by the end of the year to show, okay, yeah, Beaverton does care about its natural tree canopy. Um, so like who, who could be involved? Like we don't want the city to be doing this on its own because uh, staff are working very hard and they've got a lot going on and it's hard to take on another project. But there are a lot of organizations that that do similar work or that really push for uh, tree plantings in cities or tree protections in cities. Uh, there are some lists out here. I would encourage you all in the chat if you know of other organizations or community groups that might also be really focused on tree planting, go ahead and put those in the chat because um, I want to take note of those so we can reach out to them too. Um, but this includes like Friends of Trees and um, there's an organization called Depave Oregon that takes large parking areas or paved areas and rips up the pavement and then plants green space. So just exploring what some of these neighbor, what some of these neighborly groups are um, and how can we get these trees into the hands of residents. Um, you know, the THPRD rep earlier mentioned the planting that the Highland Knack and Central Beaverton Knack are doing in Evelyn Schiffler Park this weekend. And that's just a small example of of a community-led project where it's like, all right, we're making a small difference, but imagine if we had neighborhoods across the city all pushing the same direction, doing community plantings and pushing for a very tree-friendly city policy. So why is this the right focus? I mentioned some of this already, like this tree canopy is just being lost with a lot of new development. I mean, we're seeing it on South Cooper Mountain a lot and like growth, like we need to be growing as a city and we are growing as a city, but we also need to be protecting our, our natural habitat at the same time. Beaverton is a tree city USA, which basically means we do a good job protecting our trees, except we can be doing a lot better. <laughs> like we need to be affirming our belief that trees are valuable. Um, and we need to be pulling other people into this process of, of tree plantings and tree protections. Um, this is a way just for us to take some meaningful action. Um, and this is why like, I wanted to come to you all as soon as I heard this in our, in our neighborhood meeting last week, uh, because I think it's really important. And I wanna, I wanna see some other neighborhoods on board as well. Uh, so this is in line with a lot of the Beaverton community visions, uh, the vision statements, um, builds community, improves mobility, enhances livability. Like these are all things that people have said that they care about with the thousands of voices of feedback that have gone into this process. And we wanna help the city really fulfill its vision. And it's remarkable that something as simple as a tree can make such a big difference. So how do we measure success? Like where are the trees planted? How many, how many volunteers are involved? Uh, how easy is it for residents to get involved? Like, can they just go pick up a tree at their neighborhood elementary school? Um, or do how, what is that process like? We need to think through that some more. There's some, there are definitely some details here to work through, but the vision is here. Like we want to make it easy for people to say, yes, I want a tree in my front yard. I know I do. I don't want my, my house to get as hot as it does because we didn't have AC until just recently. And, and a lot of people just really struggle with these heat waves and through the summers that are getting hotter and uh, trees can make a substantial difference um, in that heat that we're feeling. So this is what we're hoping for from you all. And if it's open discussion here, um, but we would love uh, y'all's voice of support for the resolution that, that we're putting forward. Um, as a neighborhood association to say, hey, city of Beaverton, like city council, city staff, this is a value that we are hearing from different neighborhoods that we wanna pursue this year of trees to increase our tree canopy and increase our natural habitat and, and make for a healthier city. So I would just love to open it up. Any questions or comments you all have are welcome. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, so I can see anybody. Thank you, Kevin. 
and we do have some comments in the chat already. Uh, Colette wrote in, as an HOA member, we have been trying to get trees removed that are threatening home foundations, utilities, etc. We would love to get in on this because we love our trees, but not to the point where they destroy our homes. Yeah. Yep. And Colette is the secretary for Orchard Glen Condominiums. Oh, great. And okay. she included her email there. Colette, I will email you. Thanks, Colette. And Sharon Dunham has also added, as a former large student, it is important to have the right vegetation in the right places. Landscape you... architecture. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Landscape architecture student. Um, she says it's important to have the right vegetation in the right places. How do you ensure the proper trees are being planted? And she's in love with this project. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sharon, I don't know you're a former landscape architect student. Um, yeah, so the city's got its tree list, tree database that says like what trees can be planted and and the uh, I mean, the basically the right way, the space between the sidewalk and, and the street, like what trees are, are able to be planted there that won't rip up sidewalks or what trees are good near homes, but not to the point where they'll destroy homes to, to Colette's point. Um, so I think the city can help us out a lot with that. Yeah, the planter's trip. Thanks, Kevin. It's late. Um, but also like, there's a member of the Highland Neighborhood Association Committee. He's a He's an arborist with City of Portland, I believe. So he's really helping out a lot with some of the technical details here too. Uh, but we do we want more trees, but we want them to be the right trees. Avoid code enforcement. What about code enforcement? Oh well, the sidewalk issue. Oh yeah. Yeah. Kevin, are you? Um... Are you thinking evergreen, deciduous, both? Uh, yeah, I, I think it really depends on on locations. And I, I think it's very neighborhood specific and street specific even. Um, yeah, like if it's somewhere that you wanna have shade and or sun shining on it in the winter time so it doesn't freeze over as much, like, like deciduous trees, but trying to be flexible. Um, I see a couple other hands. Kevin? Hey, I, I'm also another Kevin. Uh, I'm the uh, code compliance inspector for the city of Beaverton. Um, I work basically the whole south end of the city. So um, Sexton Mountain, neighbor Southwest, Greenway, uh, South Beaverton, and then what will be the South Cooper Mountain is all my area of the city that I'll be um, the code, code inspector for. Um, have you met with or talked to Jared Lane, who's the Beaverton City Arborist? Um, yeah, I think one of the people who's been working on this has. Um, I know I've talked with him in the past, but not about this project. Okay, I would get in touch with him. I mean, you you are right about the the. We do have the um, approved street tree replant um, list, and Jared is you know he's compiled that list over his. 15 years here with the city. Um, and of course he can, he can talk to you more about that. But uh, just from my side with the code thing and, and to touch on, I believe it was Colette saying about the, you know, the damaging property and whatnot. So we do enforce like street trees when they become a, a problem for the, um, for the sidewalks. And we have sidewalk cracking and uplift or shifting. Um, you know, we, we come out and we handle those cases. And yep. it's, it's case by case. and, and Jared tries to save every tree, which is really good. And we, and fortunately we've been able to save more than we've had to have homeowners cut down, but um, he, he does have that, that tree list and, and what's a good, you know, what's a max height for it or what's a good, you know, how deep does the roots, do the roots go? Are they gonna be another problem in 10 to 15 years, all that stuff. So I would reach out to him. I can put his contact information in the chat if you'd like, because uh, um, you, you already have it. Yeah, I've already got it. Okay. Um, and Sharon mentioned Reggie should be dialed in. Yeah, Reggie is from the Highland Mac, and he's the yeah. one. We're aware of, yeah, we're, we're um, we know Mr. Funkin, yes. I, I figured so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but yeah, when, I mean, when my, when my turn's up, I'll explain more about the sidewalk stuff, but uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry to throw that out there, but yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, Andrew? I don't think my camera's on, but can you hear me, Allison? Yes, we can We can hear you, fine. Okay, I think I needed to be promoted to panelist again. Um, Kevin, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I wanted to give you a location that you might wanna go look at in the city of Portland, but I'm a project manager for the city of Portland. Um, I recently built a new street in uh, the 1800 block of Southeast 80th Avenue between Mill and Stevens, and I would encourage you to go look at it. Um, we actually had a bunch of uh, big old trees in the middle of the Oh, Andrew, did we lose you? Uh, we just promoted him to panelist in that. Oh. Um, there we go. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry, Andrew, I was promoting you to panelist and it, I didn't realize it was going to cause a, uh, a break in the record. Sorry. Well, after my ineptness with technology during this meeting, I have a feeling you're going to demote me off the NAC <laughs> board at the end of the meeting, but I appreciate your patience, Allison. No, anyway, I was just saying, Kevin, I hope you don't mind me putting in a bit of a shameless um, plug for a project I recently built. But if you go to the 1800 block of Southeast 80th Avenue in Portland between um, Mill and Stevens, there's some uh, big old trees in the middle of the street that... Uh, recently built a street around them. You might just enjoy seeing that. Um, I, I'm going to just switch back to my knack role here and just say, um, you know, I'm very supportive of, um, of encouraging people to plant trees more from a incentivizing standpoint as opposed to a punitive and regulatory standpoint. I, I guess the one point I want to make, um, and I'm just, these are just my personal opinions as a NAC member, I do want to make sure that we're not um, going overboard on trying to save poor quality tree canopy. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned trees uplifting sidewalks, but I'm also thinking of trees that, um, you know, they're leaning or they're um, just not in the best of health, that type of thing. So yeah. um, I think it isn't just about planting new trees, but I just want to make sure that we're not like unduly trying to preserve trees that maybe aren't in the best location, notwithstanding the plug I just put in for those trees I saved, or trees that frankly could just be replaced with something uh, that are just healthier and of better quality, because you know, trees have a life too, like the rest of us. So yeah. I think we're totally on the same page with that. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, the resolution that we're considering doesn't isn't from a kind of punitive or regulatory standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's not meant to be this is meant to be more of like, Hey, let's let's add to our tree canopy because I mean we are losing a lot of it, um, and we just want to empower some of our local residents to take some actions of their own to make their own properties or their own streets feel a little bit more comfortable. And my only other comment is, you know, people tend to always aim for the planning strip, but you know, I really think people planning in their front yards and you know that type of thing um, that's all good too. I mean, there's only if you have a really narrow planting strip, sometimes sometimes yes. those trees don't do really well when they're girdled like with a four foot planting strip. So, yep. um, you know, from my experience, it's good for people to think outside the box and not just be restricted to a planting strip. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And Kevin, I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning. Is the idea of this um, that the city would also be paying for maintenance as as the trees age? Um, I don't know that yet. I'd have to find that out. Okay. I'll write that down and I'll, I'll figure out. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. And we also had um, uh, some comments from Colette. Colette, uh, would you like to uh, speak to your comments? I think we have... I can. Okay, great. I was making sure that uh, we had the, the audio on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we, back in November, were supposed to have some trees removed that are tearing up uh, pathways, entryways to homes in our HOA. We have a, Orchard Glen condominiums has 106 homes. Um, these trees were planted during the building phase. 
Um, anyways, it got apparently rescheduled per our, the people we contracted, which was Northwest Trees, stating that the city lost the permit to remove them. And we're still dealing with that. Um, so myself, as well as Kelly, which we were talking about other matters on Barrows, um, we've now tried to, we're starting to approach this subject on our own. And I have photos of these trees uplifting sidewalks and pathways like five to six inches above level where they should have been. Um, I've been in contact with the city and it's going pretty well so far, but it's it's been a frustrating thing. So I'm glad you guys are bringing this up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Colette. Yeah, like we want to preserve people's mobility but we also want, want to have shade and I think we can have both. I, I absolutely love the tree in our front yard. In the fall, it's got this beautiful orange glow that comes through my children's bedrooms. And I love that. I really don't want to take it out, but if it's going to affect the foundation and the utilities, then that's clearly a problem. Yeah, yeah. And so being challenged by the city of where are we going to put these trees and what are we gonna replace them with then has been a real struggle. Yep. So I don't, I mean, we think we have come up with an alternative that's a smaller tree that doesn't have these root issues, um, but fighting these arborists has been very difficult. Yeah because they're just like, oh, no, you got to do this or we don't do anything. And then we're like, okay, well, is the city going to pay for the damage? Like, what do we do? Yeah, yeah, that's a hard spot to be in. So that's where I leave it in your hands. Oh, I, had, I don't think I can resolve it, but... Um, I can empathize and uh, the, maybe as part of this process, there are some trees that come out of it where it's like, hey, we know that we can get these types of trees that are really compatible, compatible, compatible with spaces right next to buildings. And we're able to get those at like free or reduced cost or something to help people transition. Yeah, I mean, there's that amazing program that I think once a year, they just give away trees. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's something we were talking about too. <laughs> no, it, it's already in place. I forget the name of it right now, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, we we're, I don't remember it either. Is it, I don't remember. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> but our team remembers, so. And my, I'm, I come from, my mother was the founder of um, Recycle Gardens, um, which is like a, Marshalls or a Ross for plants, I guess. Yeah. So anytime something was being bulldozed or destroyed, like she'd come in and she she literally said, if I can get my hands around it, I can get it out. And then it would go to a new home. Yeah, it's a great idea. Um, and it was a nonprofit and the proceeds went to spaying and neutering. And yeah, but anyways, <laughs> So I just, I don't know, these, these builders just put in whatever they really do. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later now, we're dealing with the consequences. Yeah. The city as a community is, I mean, and we have to get a handle on it. And it, it really needs to happen at a builder level. because they're the ones putting it in this garbage and then let, they don't care because they're left unaccountable 10 years later. Yeah. To uh, 
tag team on Colette's comment right there. Kevin, is there uh, any plan to affect the development code with this project? Um, you know, I don't know. That's something that I would love to see. Same um, the, the city of Beaverton did do a tree code audit just a couple months ago. It just pointed out where the tree code needs updated and what's working well or what's, what could be working better. Um, but the city staff don't, didn't have capacity to update that yet. Um, but maybe if we're able to put more pressure on it, like that bumps it up the priority list. And I think that'd be great. Um, it's one of the one of the tools or one of the pieces that I think would be available for like pushing this stuff, pushing this forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think integrating, uh, if, if there's a way to integrate this project with uh, having an impact on you know, meaningful change with the development code so that this is, mm -hmm. so that this is considered seriously as the city moves forward with all of its plans. I think, I think that would be a worthwhile uh, effort to explore. Yeah, I do too. And I think if there are several necks pushing for that too, I think the city would have to hear it. Right. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully take some action. Right. Um, so I, I realize we've all been having such a blast tonight and we are <laughs> the uh, clock has gotten away from us. Um, was there any other, uh, I see Sharon has some comments here in the chat. She says the folks who do the backyard habitat program also deal with higher ca canopies in addition to lower level natives. It's a great program. And she added that maybe to Andrew's point, there should be an education component to put in the right plant materials. And she says, this is exactly why community education is important. Yeah. And that was to Colette's point. Thank yeah. you, Sharon. All right, well, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, so what, what are the next steps on this? So you can either, you all can either decide to put the, the Neighbor Southwest NAC name behind the resolution um, as a group here tonight, or, or if, you all need to talk it over as a group, like email me and follow up with me. Um, I, I think that'd be fine too. I know the Highland Neck or the Neighborhood Neck or the Central Beaverton Neighborhood Neck are uh, presenting the BCCI, I think, I think next week or a couple weeks from now. And Miles is nodding, so that's good. <laughs> yep. um, but this is something we'll be putting pr pressure on city leadership for, for a while, but we'd love to have you with us. And are you all going, you're going to all the NACs, I'm understanding? Um, so not yet. Um, I could see that happening. I only, I only learned about this last Monday. And Allison, since you and I just talked about this stuff in South Cooper Mountain, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to try to go to Neighbors Southwest. So right now it's just you all, Central Beaverton and Highland NAC. And I think one of our other Central Beaverton board members might have been trying to go to another one. I'm not sure. So, Andrew, are we are we good to support this effort? I'm. I'm. Um... And and we understand this is in a very pre preliminary uh, stage. Nothing's set. But Kevin, you're just asking if if we support the 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 general idea. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. If if you yeah if you support the the vision and the resolution, like we can share the, the resolution when it's typed up with you all. Um, but yeah, this is just like the general support first. Okay, so Miles, are we okay to do like an informal support then? I mean, do we need to do, okay. So I guess, I guess we're good for an informal high five. <laughs> Kevin? Yes. I'm penciling, I'm penciling you in for the March uh, Sexton Mountain NAC. <clears throat> oh, you're, you gonna be, you're gonna be presenting with uh lacy all right cool let's do it who lives in the neighborhood so i think this is a great thing if if you're willing um yeah i am willing let me make sure yeah i am willing miles can you make sure i get an invitation to that meeting <sighs> andrew did you have any other further thoughts oh i just wanted to say allison i'm happy to support this um and I think it's great to reach out to the individual NACs. I think ultimately the way to get the ball rolling on this is 
for the city to take it over as a citywide initiative, but I realize you got to start somewhere and the NACs are a great place to start. So um, unless we're going to have any further discussion, Allison, I'm happy to vote in favor of a resolution to support this effort. Miles, do we need to do a, a Robert's rules or anything? Um, for this? Yeah, I, I heard a, it sounded like Andrew made a motion. Okay. I second the motion. I'll second it. And then all those in favor. Aye. Aye. Two Aye. eyes. Okay. Okay. You can add them to the letter, Kevin. All right. Great. Thank you. And and um, as soon as we have a draft of the letter, I'll, I'll send that over to you, Allison. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Kevin. Would you yeah, see thank you. on that, Kevin? I will. I will. Thank you. All right, I'm going to sign off because I'm tired, but it was nice to see you all. Thanks for having me. Same to you. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, bye. And our next item is our city update from our wonderful staff liaison, Miles Glowacki. Yeah, I will keep it brief since it's late. Um, it's not up in front of me anymore. Okay. Just want to let you know that the city's community vision is. Um, underway. The current update consists of outreach to community members, some surveys, virtual and live events, and other ways to participate. So you'll start seeing more information about that coming out soon. I encourage you to um, participate. It's how the city and the city council um, kind of decide which direction the city should be going in and what they should be focusing on. So look for those updates um, coming out. Also in city council news, um, Beaverton City Council election filing is underway. If you're interested in running for election to the City Council, you can obtain a candidate's filing handbook and the deadline to file is Tuesday, March 8th by 5 p.m. We're electing four at-large positions. Um, council positions one, two, and five will be nominated at the primary ele election. And then at the general election will be voted in to serve four-year terms. Council three is a vacant position due to resignation and it has three years remaining on its unexpired term of office. Candidates have to be 18 years of age and have lived with a qualified elector and have lived in city limits for six months prior to the election date. Um, if you go to the beavertonoregon.gov website and type in elections, you can read all about it. And Council's got some interesting things coming up on their agenda this month. Um, comprehensive school resource officer review, Millican Way extension project, and the downtown equity strategy update. Um, they're gonna do some work sessions on legislative bills, capital improvement plan priorities, and reimbursement districts. Um, there is a city council meeting February 22nd is the next one, it looks like. And that's all my updates. Great, thank you, Miles. Any questions for Miles? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, NAC business, there's no NAC business on the table for tonight, except that if um, we have any Community members and neighbors interested in joining the NAC, that door is always open and uh, please get in touch with us if you're interested in joining as a board member at large or um, also if you're interested in a leadership position. And visitor comment period. Sharon or Kevin, did you have anything else you'd like to add tonight? Me, right, Ms. Kevin? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a couple of things. Um, spring's around the corner. So we're asking that if, if uh, homeowners are going to be doing any kind of bark dusting or uh, putting mulch down or any, any kind of building material in their yard, please don't store it in the roadway. Um, it, it causes a big hazard and then there's erosion control issues and everything like that. And it's also a $500 fine if can be a $500 fine if you're found guilty in court. So um, that is something that that code compliance is looking for. Um, shopping carts are another uh, kind of a program that we're re reviving in the city. So 
shopping carts around the city are being collected and taken to a storage location and business owners are, are going to be contacted to pick those carts up or and be fined or and or be fined or uh, the carts can will be disposed of. Um, and from what I understand, those carts are very expensive. But if you see them around, um, you know, obviously let us know. You can report them on the code compliance website um, or email, you know, one of, one of us. Uh, I'll put all my contact information in the chat. Uh, sidewalks are another thing with, with the nicer weather coming around. Sidewalks are going to be getting reported as being uplifted or, or broken or whatever um, the cases with those. And, and we'll be coming around um, and tagging doors for sidewalk replacement. We do have a grant that allows for reimbursement or partial reimbursement of the um, sidewalk cost uh, of repair to homeowners. And that's something that I can obviously expand on if, if uh, people are uh, curious about that or, or want to know more or if they want to self-report a sidewalk issue that's fine I'll, again i'll leave all my contact information in the chat um i think that's everything abandoned abandoned vehicles if it's on the roadway please contact the police department code compliance can't um, handle vehicles on the roadway we're not allowed to we don't have any kind of way to run a plate or find a registered owner but discarded vehicles on private property is something we can handle uh, if you see a neighbor um parking a vehicle in, in their grass or on their yard somewhere, um, please let us know. That's something we'll, we'll take care of. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much it as far as code compliance goes. Um, again, I'll, I'll leave my contact information in the chat for everyone. Um, I am your code compliance officer for, for Neighbor Southwest. So contact me with any questions, comments, or concerns. Great, thank you, Kevin. And Kevin, just uh, are you, will you be at future meetings, future NAC meetings also, or? I, I hope to be. Um, I don't necessarily have to be. Like, if there's nothing pertinent to us, you know, I mean, I, I hope to be because then at least we're here. If people have, you know, it always happens when you when you're talking with people or something comes up, and it's like, oh hey, uh, by the way, while I got you here, I have this question. So yes, I, I hope to attend them. Um, if not me. Uh, if I'm out of town or, or out of the office, then one of my coworkers will do it. Um, but yeah, we hope to have a presence in every NAC meeting. So um, we have done a pretty good job of splitting up the 11 NACs of the city. Um, and there are three code compliance officers working in the city. So we are busy, but we are absolutely able to meet with homeowners at their property or, or take calls or, or answer emails. So, but yes, I, I plan to be there. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to meet you. And thanks so much for letting us know that Neighbor Southwest is in your jurisdiction. Appreciate I, it. I, uh, I don't have a lot of stuff that honestly that happens in Neighbor Southwest. I think the biggest issue that I have in Southwest is sidewalks, which we have all over the city, sidewalk issues. So fortunately, you guys are, you know, your NAC is very, uh, very low maintenance, which is great because some of the other NACs are not. Um, but yeah, are there any questions for me? I'm happy to answer anything while I'm here. Kevin, I have one. Absolutely. Um, so when you mentioned about the bark dust um, offloading onto the street and a fine, mm -hmm. um, I know that there are neighbors who do that. And if they are quick to, you know, kind of distribute it in their yards, what, what's, is there a time limit or is it like a no, no deal? We, we just ask that, that if you can avoid it by, by any means, like, I know that there are a lot of homes that have really sloped driveways. So putting it in the driveway isn't really the right. uh, an option. Um, we prefer it to not be in the planter strip, but but if that's where you got to put it to keep it out of the roadway, then that's fine. But some people will get you know a, a full yard or two, and that's a big load that isn't really going to fit in the uh, planter strip. And then you got then you end up blocking the sidewalk, and we don't want that either. So we just ask that if you report it, we'll go out there and we'll talk with the homeowners. Um, our goal is never to cite people first. We always prefer just uh, just general compliance and just saying, hey, like, what do you need from us to uh, make this happen? Like, do you, do you need three days? Do you need the weekend? What, what do you need from us? And if we have that, and we kind of have that, we build that relationship with the homeowner, then usually it goes pretty quick. So we, we just ask that if it gets reported, then we'll, we'll go at least talk to the homeowner and, and say, hey, what's going on here? Thanks, that, that really helps. Good, anything else? Kevin, are you any relation to Larry? <laughs> I can neither confirm or deny before you tell me is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a very good thing. <laughs> yes, that's my father. 
tell them hello for me, will you? I absolutely will, sir. It's a small world. It is indeed. I mean, you said you worked for City of Portland. I was like, oh, I wonder if my dad knows knows Andrew. So yeah, and tell your dad I I I want to go have coffee with him when the stupid pandemic is over. So you got it. I'll let him know. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kevin. Yep, no problem. Sharon, did you have a question or is that a souvenir hand for us to take home with us? Souvenir. <laughs> Thank you. Well, with that, uh, that's our that's it for tonight. And uh, thank you so much to everyone. And I apologize that we ran over um, with our time sensitive uh, agenda items that we needed tonight. And appreciate everyone's patience and really meaningful input throughout the night. So thank you, Kevin and Sharon. Big thanks to Andrew uh, for serving on the NAC also. And Huge thanks as always to Miles from the city of Beaverton. Thank you. And I think that's it. Miles, did you have anything else to add? Okay. All right. Well, have a restful night, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time.